Welcome. So Hi. in this session, we're going to be talking about, I think, a couple of buzzwords in retail and in all marketing, frankly, um, authenticity and agility. Um, but in the context of a really interesting luxury brand that has a really storied history, but also, I think, is entering a new era. And so, um, Karina, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and your role. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much uh, to Brand Innovators and their incredible, amazing team for constantly bringing everyone together and giving us those insane and amazing opportunities. Um, so my name is Karina. I'm the acting uh, CMO and CDO for Tuno Buchara now. Um, Tuno, I think if you're in the city, you might have seen one of our stores. We are a luxury um, multi-brand retailer of watches, and we just... I always feel it's it's 100 years ago, but it was quite recently in 2020 reopened our flagship on 57th Street called Time Machine. And we also just last year um, reopened our second flagship in Las Vegas, which is, I think, still the world's biggest um, luxury watch and, and jewelry store to that date. And we were acquired in 2018 by Buchra, who is the biggest retailer for luxury watches as well in Europe, mainly based out of, based out of Switzerland. So now Globally, we are the biggest multi-brand retailer for luxury watches and fine jewelry. Um, so tell us about that acquisition and what that's meant for the brand here in North America. I mean, acquisitions are obviously like, like almost like a merger. There's a lot of post-merger that goes on through years. But um, what was really interesting for us is the question around rebranding. So Buchra is a very, very strong brand name in the in, in Europe, and also coming from Europe myself, that was the brand I was familiar with. So I first didn't even know Turno when I got approached for this role. But then also um, Turno has this incredible rich history, brand history and brand recognition in the United States. Turno was established in, the 19, in 1900 and Buchra in 1888. So they are both like over 100 years old, which is remarkable. And the biggest question was, do we rebrand, yes or no? And if we rebrand, how do we approach that? Also knowing pretty easily at the beginning that no one here even knows how to say Buchra. And there's no right or wrong way, because even in Switzerland, depending if you're in the German-speaking or Swiss-speaking part or wherever you are, you will say it differently. So we did a study. We worked um, with a big company here in, in New York and did like a real, like, deep, deep research, probably one of the biggest research projects I've ever done. So we did like quantitative, qualitative, we went out to VIP clients, we went out to broader clients, we did focus groups, and we had two main questions. One was, obviously, if you know to know, what is your, what are your thoughts about rebranding and do you know Buchra at all? And then also, what do you connect with Buchra if you know Buchra? But then also, what is your, and this was a while ago now, three years ago, what is your expectation on a luxury shopping experience? What do you expect from a luxury brand if you are getting in touch with it through online or through media or through obviously the in-store experience? And the insights were really remarkable and very surprising to all of us. And it was interesting to see how much brand value to know has in the United States and also how the consumers reacted to a potential rebrand and they were like, why would you do that? Are you sure? So um, we came up with a hybrid approach, which I honestly now also reflecting on it think was a really, really good solution for us because we're actually still leveraging that. It gave us so much opportunity to really take the clients on a journey to really explain to them, we are now, we, we used to be to know, you're not going to lose out on anything. We're still the same places, but now we're going to go on that journey of becoming Buchra and that meant massive upgrades of the store experience, like literally starting from like in store redesign, but also a new upgrade to the experience coming up a new website. So really Really a long-term journey and because we did that hybrid hybrid and we still have that in place today we weren't scared that someone would like suddenly lose contact with us or no longer understand who we were so it's really like taking the client on that journey of the rebranding that's so interesting. I think the whenever you have a historic, like so much historical legacy, and um, you know, especially for a, I think a product that's so personal, yeah. right? Like Always. most people it's get the their you know, the timepiece yeah. that's been the stories. The I mean, stories. even if I would ask anyone, like your jewelry or your timepiece, there's always yeah. an incredible story. 
Exactly. So, so knowing that, you know, and we're talking about authenticity with retail brands, right? Can you talk a little bit about what that means, you know, in a contemporary kind of marketplace, um, knowing that there is this history for the brand, and as you're thinking about creating new new customer experiences? I think in this um, also like coming together of two like re retail brands in that way, um, joining force and becoming one. What was very interesting from the beginning was the values. Like even in the earliest speeches from a German perspective or whoever spoke, it was like, well, we see the same values from Buchra that we see within Turno. And that comes to the authenticity, right? Because authenticity is built on like, obviously through consistency, but also coming from your val values. Who are you as a brand? How do you define yourself? And then you need to be consistent consistent with that. And it's so crucial because sometimes I feel like we still make the mistake of thinking brand authenticity means is related to like, or means you just need to like be good in a way or have like a strong corporate social responsibility program. Yes, that, that too, but it's really who are you as a brand and can you hold that? And I feel we also are family owned. Um, and unfortunately the owner passed away just two months ago in his late eighties. And the, the core values that he implemented, those are the core values of the company still today. That's great. Um, and so those core values, knowing that that's like the backbone of the marketing, or just the brand strategy in general. So how, how is that coming through in the store experience? So I know that's a huge area of investment yeah. for you guys. Can you tell us just a little bit more about the store experience yeah. and what you're really proud of there? Absolutely. I mean, to, to the first part of your question, it comes through like obviously in the, how do we follow up, right? Honesty, trust, you build trust because you buy, you make a major investment, right? You just don't want to like spend that amount of money and then not hear from us ever again or not know where to go for your repairs or for a, a yearly or five year check or something like that. So it's, it's really based on trust and especially the complication we have a little bit. And I, last year I talked with a luxury um, automotive company about this as well. When you have scarcity, when you cannot deliver the product that everyone wants, then it comes even more about like that trust, that follow up, that like being honest and making sure that you get in touch with your clients. So that's a big part of those coming back to the authenticity and the core values. The other part, the experience, is, has been a major topic also coming into that whole, like we are becoming Buchra, we are rebranding and we are upgrading all our stores. So it's literally from like the way you see the stores now and I th would really encourage you, if you have a little bit of time, 57th Street Time Machine, you see that store over three floors with like three bars. So it's really about like hospitality. So we looked a lot into hospitality. You get a lot of inspiration from luxury hotels or hospitality in general to create an experience where you feel welcome. Right, and it starts like literally with the design of the store, the wood you use, the architectural layout, the lighting, but then also how we greet you, what we offer you, how we like follow up with you. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of room to play. And there's a playbook actually about the Bukhra experience and that starts literally from how we place the chocolate on the tray, how we do the coffee, what our holiday specialty drinks are at the bars. So it's it's a whole 360 concept. I love that. How does that extend into the like the outpost stores so the not the flagships necessarily but the the more local experiences that somebody in San Francisco or in Los Angeles or in Minneapolis might have That's a very good question <laughs> you want to obviously be, be consistent right so not every store has like three bars and can do like and has like a barista making like but we offer coffee and drinks and obviously it's also the how we greet you again how the your experience is within the store that should be consistent that's a lot that's a big big project for training, like the amount of like money we invest in training and the constantly redoing, redoing, and obviously for everyone knowing in retail, you have a lot of turnaround in terms of like your people, right? So you constantly train, 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 because you want it to be consistent. And then obviously also the follow-up, that's a huge part of it. And it's not just about like, Ideally, and I say ideally, <laughs> I don't want you to have an experience in the store, right? I want you to have the same experience if you call customer service, if you email us, or if you want a follow up on something, right? And also on the website as well. Um, so, all of this, you know, knowing that there's all these touch points, potential touch points, I'm curious how that's, you know, from on the agility point of this conversation, how you're responding to and defining, you know, the, the changing customer and what their expectations are of a brand experience um, like Torno. I think you... I used to think in, in segments and like have your personas. I'm kind of like removing from that because I just feel like 
you just need to be on it like wherever you are, right? It needs to be 360, my website needs to work, my customers or everything needs to like work and be in place and just like get, provide that same experience. It needs to come, it comes back to the values and what I want you to, to experience when you get in touch with us through whatever point that is. Um, on the website, we still, we have a major project right now that will take also a certain amount of time to like revamp that completely. So that's in the works. And then it should hopefully reflect like the experience that you have in the stores today. Um, I know resale is is becoming a bigger part of the brand, and and I'm curious how that's playing into bringing new customers. You know, potentially a, a more of an entry level customer. Let's say you mean pre owned. Pre owned. Yeah. So no, no worries. No worries. Oh. I, I, it's. Um, sorry, I didn't know we were. I love this. <laughs> Perfect. Um, pre owned is huge. Pre owned has what a lot of people don't know that Tuno was like one of the first players in the pre owned business and the certified pre-owned watch business and certified is crucial because every watch that we sell pre-owned is certified goes through a whole like authentication process and I think some of you who are like more um, in the in this watch world know that Rolex launched a program for authentication as well so now you're not just only getting our to know Bukhra authentication but we also send every watch that's already going through a full service chain to Rolex to then be authenticated again. So it's basically double. And you get a global warranty right now from Rolex with any um, certified pre-owned Rolex watch that you purchase with that, which was a huge, huge momentum for the watch industry last year. And um, so it's always been a big, big part. It's a huge market. It's a very, very interesting market with a lot of ups and downs, especially the last two years have been crazy. It's almost like stock, and I still believe there's a correlation with crypto. But um, it's it's stabilizing right now. So it's a very huge market, and it's very interesting because you might think that it's like the entry point or the door opener, and it's definitely, but it's also for people who are real watch aficionados and collectors. They also come to certified pre-owned because it's just so interesting what you can get or if you want a burst here or something like there's it's it's a really great uh, field to play in um, so knowing that there is a you know a huge world online of collectors who yes. are talking about their collections seeking out really like you know rare gems um, how are you thinking about kind of activating those communities of you know pre-owned enthusiasts who maybe again are, are talking to maybe a slightly different audience than you have historically spoken to what we do, which comes in line with the experience, which we have, especially the last two years, we've heavily like invested, but also like really, I mean, we did over like 250 events last year, and that's just events that are from corporate that doesn't include like smaller cocktails or little like uh, things in the stores that the stores run by themselves. So we bring those communities together on different topics that can be for one specific brand partner, that can be for a certified pre-owned, and we usually always connect it with like an experience that can go from like a wine tasting to a panel discussion to like a literal like class where you can like make your own not make your own watch, but we take it apart and we teach you how to bring it back together, which is super, super interesting. So we bring those communities together. Um, and I'm curious if you're seeing any new trends or any differences as people become more comfortable spending on, you know, spending significant, making significant investments online, but also, you know, having the store experience. Are you seeing any shifts in, in like overall revenue between those two channels? And do you guys have aspirations around that overall picture? It has been a pretty even picture for us over the last few years. So yes, we see, sometimes we are surprised by what we see online where you're like, really, someone made that purchase? Like through the online channel but I think people also still like the store experience right because they like to like obviously you, this is a product that you want to touch that you want to feel that you also like to have that moment right because every moment when you buy this should be like a celebration because it's not you, you don't buy a watch every day so there is something that you're either celebrating or you want also that that moment and we see that still goes back to the store experience that makes sense um, so knowing that Training the team, having like a really clear understanding of the brand is such an important part of kind of every customer touch point that you have. I'm curious how you are organizing your marketing division and the other and, and digital just in general um, to really respond quickly to be, you know, set up for success in this fast kind of fast paced world that we're in. I think we, we I 
I don't really like to think in like classic organizational charts, but much more like cross-functional, like a big part, which I was very surprised even like years ago, we, we this, there was no more discussion, which we had like five or four years we discussed on these panels, like the role of like classic brand marketing, media and, and um, digital. And it was still not common that everyone had it like under kind of the same roof. And now like for me, it's like literally customer service, digital, media, PR, all that is like one line item basically. So we can exactly hit all those touch points. Are you finding any like interesting challenges? Like I know you mentioned that turnover in stores is something that is just in terms of the, the retail staff, but in general, are you seeing anything that feels new post pandemic in terms of your team and how they're kind of building strategies? I think just that, that part of experience, like that constant, like what can we do to keep it interesting and engaging for the clients? And that goes beyond like, you, you know, your classic marketing strategies and obviously the, the audiences, right? I don't wanna, I don't have my strategy for this generation, that generation, that generation. I just wanna make sure because I see people that I never thought would be on TikTok, being on TikTok and getting the information from TikTok. So it's more like, how do I leverage that channel? Not just thinking about one audience group, but like for multiple audience groups. So I think it's really about using what we already know, what we need to leverage from all the media perspectives. But for me, it's like really that part of the experience. Like how do I go beyond my classic media, my social channels? Like how can I really enhance that experience? That's great. Um, you mentioned hospitality is a, an industry that you, you, you take inspiration from. Are there other spaces that you find particularly inspiring to kind of you know, just push the brand forward in terms of an experience perspective? Everywhere. I mean, for, for me, it's like, for me personally, it's a lot like hospitality, so like restaurants or obviously hotels, but then also like anything that's cultural or art or multimedia, because we also think through how can we activate a store in an interesting way? What else can I be have like in, in Time Machine? We curate art. So we are currently working on the plans through mid-24 of which artists are we bringing in? How can we make that interesting? Can we do like live graffiti? Like, say, just to bring it all together and create interesting audiences. We work with Sotheby's um, also on curating, not just like um, on the pre-owned side, but then also like, do they have a rare whiskey auction? Can I do a connection there? Like there are so many touch points to again, coming back to leverage the experience, bringing new experiences, not just for like a smaller amount, like group of VIP clients, but in the store for everyone to just see and experience it while yeah. they're in the store. Yeah, partners are such an interesting vehicle for that, exactly. right? It's just kind of the unexpected exactly. kind of juxtaposition of brands, expertise, et cetera. So are there any, like, you know, you mentioned Sotheby's, but as you're like looking ahead, are there partnerships that, or do you have a dream partnership that you would we love had, to see happen? I mean, we kind of had found our dream partner, but we obviously want to explore more. We we really love, we did a partnership with Hypebeast last year, which was which used to be a media partner for us, but they were so intrigued. Like it was really also through like personal relationships. They loved the pre-owned business. And they said, why can we not do something? We celebrate pre-owned with cool and upcoming designers. And then we mix the audiences. We bring in like your classic clients and then also our audience. So we had a really cool party where we got new like the cool hip <laughs> high piece crowd and our crowd and everyone had so much fun and it was an um we had it for two weeks like an exhibition of up and coming like established but up and coming streetwear designers and they paired like we styled an outfit and then paired it with the watch to it and then told the story of the watch and the story of the designer and that was incredible and then that's basically your insta experience that's a perfect example of your insta experience and then you play it 360 because because obviously we had media from it, I had social from it, I had everything from, from those two weeks and that's amazing. Um, so the, the social piece of that, I know we haven't really talked as much about yeah. social. I mean, you mentioned that yeah. you know you have a, a strategy for TikTok yeah. potentially, or you're starting to show up on some of these yeah. channels. What what drives your social strategy or how do you think about that and how are you thinking about it for 2024 in particular? It's something that's on top of mind, especially for 24, because we now, as we become more and more Buchra, we have a louder brand voice because 
traditionally we are we cater to all our brand partners. We are multi-brand retailer, so it's more about like leveraging our brand partners and working through them and with them, and not so much through us as a brand. But now with Buchra, we have the opportunity to really, as our own brand, like step into like really showcase our own brand, and that's where we have more opportunity also for the social channels. Um, so fine jewelry being like a bit, potentially a bigger part of Correct. the overall picture. Correct. So how are there some early indicators of things that you're excited about with that? Or um, we're super excited because it's still like it's still like a, a, a baby, and it's an incredible, beautiful baby because <laughs> we just launched it two years ago, and we have like an atelier like in in Lucerne, Switzerland. So we have a beautiful collection which is all like designed and and made in in Switzerland, and then we obviously also have partners there. So we also multi brand jewelry retailer. So there's that's a an incredible opportunity for us, but also a little bit of our challenge because we are so used as like being predominantly watches and catered to a certain audience. So now like a educating that audience that now we also carry jewelry, but bringing in a new audience without losing your original audience, that's a very interesting challenge for us. Um, so in terms of, of 2024 and, you know, being at kind of around NRF, are there other like kind of bigger retail trends that are on your radar that you think are going to be interesting for, uh, for Tourneau? I always come back to the experience part, yeah, because everything like media, I mean, we, we, we are rethinking media as well, like what is really, what is most impactful, right? I mean, the story is always like, how do you invest wisely? Like, how do you get the most bang for your buck, basically? What, what does that look like? And we're not only just thinking that for our brand like Buchra, but also for our, all our partner brands, because we do the media plans for all the partner brands in collaboration with them, obviously. So definitely social, but I, again, like the key part always comes back to the experience. Like, what can we do to create an experience, to create more education, brand awareness, and how do we cater to the right audiences? Um, so switching gears a little bit, I know that you're quite passionate about leadership and leading in a certain way and really advocating for yeah, women Going in into reviews, I'm not passionate about leadership <laughs> at all right now. <laughs> no, just kidding. But I'm curious about how you think about building teams and, and the way that you just like think about running no, an organization. Yeah, yeah. Um, potentially no, in no, I like because we started on authenticity, right? I, I really am a firm believer and learner because I haven't figured it out yet, but authentic leadership is one of my passion topics. I did an executive MBA now like a long time ago but I, I always thought I needed an MBA and I found, found out that the MBA was not necessarily needed but what I really loved was everything that I could gain from the topics of leadership and authentic leadership and I think that comes back to authentic brands it comes all from within I'm very lucky today that I work with an incredible CEO who is an authentic leader in my personal point of view and having the ability to work with someone like that and then bringing it to your teams as well and helping people to show up the way they are and like kind of have that, you know, transparent feedback, but also like honesty and integrity. I think that's, that's for me at least really special and that's something I strive for. And I think if we can all strive for that, then also other topics will be much easier, right? Then the topics around inclusion, diversity, female empowerment, like all these topics are, are rooted within the authentic leadership, at least for me. Yeah, it makes sense. I think um, I feel like the conversation in the last five years has been so much centered on um, psychological safety and you know creating huge topic creating right now. Yeah, where you yeah. can you know yeah. I think Google could did a huge study on this. Yeah. like most successful teams were the ones yeah. in which this was present, not necessarily the yeah. highest performers. Um, but because I mean, people want to show up, they want to yeah. perform, but do you give them the empowerment to perform, and do you also give them sometimes the understanding that maybe there is something going on because there's always something going on. That doesn't mean like you can just take like endless sabbaticals or something, but yeah. there should be more understanding if that makes sense. Right. right. And also those, you know, with psychological safety, theoretically, you are safer to make mistakes. You're safer to try new Correct. things. And if you know, agility and innovation is so important yeah. for every business yeah. today, it's kind of yeah. essential, essential yeah. you know, to be able to, to lead in that way. So. Yeah. Great. Um, well, I think those are the, you know all of the questions that I prepared. I'm curious if folks in the audience have any questions, questions as well. Here we go. 
So one of the things that I've seen over the past decade in the luxury watch market is scarcity. You have best-selling watches and virtually every public, I, I realize you're not publicly traded, but publicly traded watch companies have had wait lists. And so I know that your biggest brand is Rolex, or I believe it is at least. And with that, how have you, you know, you talk so much about the customer experience and all the things you do to woo them in. And yet you're selling 100,000 to $1.5 million, maybe more watches, and they're not available at times. How do you deal with something like that because you don't want to lose that person? Yeah, that's that's why I always say when we talk about experience, it's not just how you come the first time in the store, it's also that follow-up, right? And that's for us, based on the scarcity, that's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. It's about like really making sure like it's explained correctly because it's not like that someone is... We are talking about like literally little pieces of art, right? They are handmade. Right, and they don't no want to make mess, more, is my understanding. The companies will not, you know, Rolex will not overproduce. And so that's a real challenge in your business, I would think. It's it's changing also. Okay. It's changing also. So I can't speak for Rolex, but like there are there are new production facilities being built. And the, so, but definitely the, for me, for coming from like, the experience part, it's about that follow-up. So how do I keep you engaged? How do I explain it to you? How do I make sure I come back to you three months, six months later saying, hey, I still know that you went, came to us, that you, are you still interested? I still have you top of mind because that's where it's, where it comes back to me from an experience perspective. May I ask a second question, please? There are all, of, and you alluded to them, but there are all these luxury watch clubs that I learned about over a decade ago. And with the pre-owned business, do you ever, if you have somebody who wants a million dollar, $2 million watch, and you know that certain people have bought it, is there anything that you do to reach out to those people to see, if, or you gauge to see, are you interested in turning it? Like, I just know, I've met some guys who have some incredible watch collections and probably wouldn't miss about 10 of them and probably would trade them in if they could, but they don't actively engage with a company like yours or even the others. I mean, we have a, a trade and buy program, so that's pretty well known. So people usually a, approach us, and then obviously we sometimes also go out and just like educate about, are you aware that we have this program? But, yeah. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. You. Very good questions. <laughs> Any other questions? <clears throat> okay, well, I'll say Karina and Natalie, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.